Well, good morning, church family. I hope wherever you are, it's a great day for you, and we're glad that you're joining us with joining with us once again for worship on Facebook Live, YouTube, wherever the platform works for you. We're looking forward to being in your homes during these days. Join me as we begin with that great song about worshiping the Lord with Hallelujah. Your love is amazing. Your love is amazing, steady and unchanging. Your love is a mountain, firm beneath my feet. Your love is a mystery, how you gently lift me. When I am surrounded, your love carries me.
morning. It is so good to see all of you here this morning as we gather uh, to worship our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. I know that you are not here, but it feels like you are all here as you sit around and watch this, whether it be on Facebook Live or on YouTube. This morning I want to start with 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3. Praise the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has given us a new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Pray with me. Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning very thankful that we can use this uh, technology to reach out into the homes of so many and to share the gospel and spend some time in worship. Lord, I pray for each and every one of us that you have kept us safe and that you have been able to uh, touch each and every one of our lives. Lord, we pray that this service will be bring you glory, but it also be a great comfort to these who are watching. In Jesus' name, amen. We gather once again uh, via uh, live stream. We are recording this a little bit early to make sure that we don't have any technical glitches. It worked very good last week. I believe uh, we uh, had 1,400 views according to Facebook. Now that may be people who just watched it for a few minutes uh, or people who watched the entire service. We do not know. It may have been some people who are really smart. They listened to Rob sing and then they turned it off when it got time for me to preach. We don't know. But 1,400 people were touched by uh, this broadcast last week. And we hope that uh, you continue to share these videos, uh, continue to uh, host watch parties like many of you did, uh, as this is what we are becoming, what is becoming the new norm for us. I want to say uh, one thing uh, as we begin. This is the season in which we at our church give to the Annie Armstrong Easter offering. The Annie Armstrong Easter offering is a time in which we uh, give money towards our North American Mission Board and the missionaries that work all over um, North America, particularly in the United States and Canada. And I want to encourage you, I know that you're not here, but I want to encourage you to continue to give to that. We do that from right, right around the beginning of March up until Easter. And we don't know if we'll have a service actually in a, the sanctuary between now and then, so I encourage you to please give, and there'll be opportunities, uh, ways that you can give that we'll be talking to you a little bit later. But just as a reminder, I want you to uh, turn your attention to the screen net now, and we have a special video reminding you of the great work that our North American Mission Board does. Thank you. Every Sunday morning, you hit snooze. Once, maybe twice. You blow dry, you button down, you buckle up. You squeeze into your Sunday best. You keep your hands and feet and neckties in the car at all times. You come early. You run late. You sing. You listen. You preach. You pray. And then you go. And wherever you are led to go, wherever you dream of going, we are there. We are the North American Mission Board. With tools, with training, with two different pathways, we connect you and your church to your next missional opportunity. When you want to welcome a refugee who's lonely, when you want to rescue a teenager who's trafficked, or feed a man who's hungry, when you want to care for a child who's neglected, or rebuild a home that's flooded, Send Relief gives you and your church real life opportunities to learn and do. In places where churches are not, where the population is big, but the gospel influence is small, where missionaries are called to start something from nothing. SEND Network gives resources and training and support. And SEND Network connects your church with church planners so that together 
you can change the world. There are thousands of them. Church planning missionaries. Send relief missionaries. In big cities and small towns. Feeding and teaching and loving. Planning 25 churches every single Sunday and baptizing thousands of new believers every single year. They give their lives and you give your treasure. You send these missionaries out into the world when you and your church sacrificially give to the Annie Armstrong Easter Offering and the Cooperative Program. And there are thousands more chaplains in foxholes and police cars and hospitals and workplaces. They all need you. And you need them. Because outside the four walls of your church, where they are, that's where you are at your best. Every believer really can one day live on mission. You and your church just need the very best tools to make it happen. That's why we exist. That's why we create resources like the three circles. Because whether it's an evangelism tool you download to your phone, or a compassion ministry our Send Relief experts help you launch, or a new church you help start through the Send Network. Everything we do is centered on helping you and your church share the gospel. That's why we all do what we do every Sunday morning and every day after that. So as you pray, as you go, and as you discover what living on mission looks like in your world, the North American Mission Board is here for you. It's a familiar tune, and I want you to pay close attention to the words to this hymn. How do we know God will take care of us through these difficult days and the times of the coronavirus? Because we can look back at all God has done in the past, not only in Scripture, but in our own lives as well. The hymn is, we look back, we look behind at all you've done.
is here with us as we take this worship for you and wherever you are, in your home, in your vehicle, at Grandma's house, He is here as you worship Him. Sing it again.
this morning we're going to pick up on our sermon series where we left off last week. We uh, finished up as we were talking about Jesus' calling of his disciples. We're uh, in a sermon series right now called Living Hope. We start out talking about um, Jesus' baptism, the hope that, that we find there at the beginning of his ministry. Then we moved on to Jesus' temptation there in the wilderness. We talked about the hope that we receive through trials. And then we talked about last week the hope in our calling. Today we're going to be talking about the hope that we find in Jesus' power. This morning we are going to be talking about particularly his miracles. As we look at Jesus' miracles, all the different way, things that he did while he was on this earth, we find that he healed the sick. We find that he took care of and uh, gave the blind their sight. We see that he even raised from the dead. But out of all the Gospels, there's only one miracle, except for the resurrection, that we find in all four of those. And that is Jesus feeding of the 5,000. And so if you would turn in your Bibles to John chapter 6, verses 1 through 14, you can uh, read along with me. We'll start in verse 1. After this, Jesus crossed the Sea of Galilee, and a huge crowd was following him because they saw the signs that he was performing by healing the sick. So Jesus went up a mountain and sat down there with his disciples. Now the Passover, a Jewish festival, was near. Therefore, when Jesus looked up and noticed a huge crowd coming toward him, toward him, he asked Philip, Where will we buy bread so these people can't, can eat? He asked this to test him, for he himself knew what he was going to do. Philip answered, Two hundred denarii worth of bread wouldn't be enough for each of them to have a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, There's a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish. But what are they for so many? Then Jesus said, Have the people sit down. There was plenty of grass in that place, so they sat down. The men numbered about 5,000. Then Jesus took the loaves, and after giving thanks, he distributed them who were seated. So also with the fish, as much as they wanted. When they were full, he told his disciples, Collect the leftovers so that nothing is wasted. So they collected them and filled twelve baskets with the pieces from the five barley loaves that were left over by those who had eaten. When the people saw the sign he had done, they said, This really is the prophet who has come into the world. Pray with me. Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you. Lord, I thank you so much that we have the opportunity to reach into people's homes and to share this word of Scripture. We thank you for this story of how you cared for people. We are thankful that you still care for people. Lord, I pray as we walk through this passage that you will help guide and direct us. In Jesus' name, amen. This morning, as we continue looking at the life of Jesus, as we march towards Easter Sunday morning, it is important for us to understand that he is the Son of God, and with that comes great power. That power is what makes it possible for us to know that he is the Son of God and that he can save us from our sins. Throughout his ministry, as he did miracle after miracle, it was to show the people who he was. It was to prove to them. But yet so many, as they saw those miracles, failed to believe that he was truly the Son of God. Here we have an instance in which Jesus is showing this great and miraculous power once again. So let's start by understanding that he has the power to know our needs. The story is a very familiar one. Most of us are aware of the feeding of the 5,000 parable. I mean, the feeding of the 5,000 story. It is a situation in which Jesus used his power to touch people's lives in a very practical way. Every single one of us gets hungry. We get hungry and we need to feed. The 
people there were hungry. They had traveled from long distances so that they could hear Jesus. And Jesus had got into the boat and went across the Sea of Galilee to get some respite, to get some peace with his disciples. But the people still followed. And as they gathered, they were out in a place where there wasn't much food. And his disciples began to worry. What were they going to do with all of these? Jesus knew their needs. He knew that they needed to be fed. But not only did he know that the people needed to be fed, he also knew that Philip needed more faith. He knew that Andrew needed encouragement and the people needed food. Let's look at verses 4 through 6. It said, Now the Passover, a Jewish festival, was near. Therefore, when Jesus looked up and noticed a huge crowd coming toward him, he asked Philip, Where will we buy bread so these people can eat? He asked Philip because Philip was from this region. Philip knew the, the towns that were close by. But he also asked Philip because he knew how Philip was going to respond. He knew that Philip was going to respond the way he did. The way Philip responded was, it would take 200 denarii worth of bread to feed these people. 200 denarii is equivalent to about eight months' salary at that time. It was more money than Jesus and his disciples would have had in their treasury. It was more money than the people there sitting about would have had with them if they all gathered it together. It was a great sum of money. The need was great. The need was so great that it couldn't be met in any common way. The needs that we have are great. When Jesus looks upon our lives, he knows the needs that we have, and he knows how great they are, and he knows that we cannot meet them. He knows the hurts, the troubles that you have. He knows the struggles that you are going through. He knows your financial difficulties. He knows your fears and your worries. And most importantly, he knows that you have a need for a Savior in salvation that you nor I can take care of. Jesus knows those needs, and he knows that he can take care of them. James chapter 1, verses 2 through 4 says, Consider it a great joy, my brothers, whenever you experience various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. But endurance must do its complete work so that you may be mature and complete, lacking nothing. Whatever's going on in your life, whatever the need is in your life, it is so that you can grow and be mature. But let me try to say to you, Jesus knows the troubles that you have, and he is there to take care of you. All you have to do is ask. All you have to do is trust. All you have to do is believe that he knows those needs. A great old hymn, His Eyes on the Sparrow, the first verse goes like this. Why should I feel discouraged? Why should the shadows come? Why should my heart feel lonely? And long for heaven and home. When Jesus is my portion, a constant friend is he. His eye is on the sparrow, and I know he watches over me. His eye is on the sparrow, and I know he watches me. That hymn reminding us that Jesus watches even the small sparrow, he watches all things. He's watching over you. He knows the needs that you have in your life. As Jesus looked out amongst that multitude, he knew the needs. He knew the people were hungry. He knew Philip needed faith. And he knew Andrew needed encouragement. But it is more than it, but it is more than he knows our needs. He also has the power to fulfill our needs. Look at verses 10 and 11. 
Verse 10 tells us, Then Jesus said, Have the people sit down. There was plenty of grass in that place, so they sat down. The men numbered about 5,000. Then Jesus took the loaves, and after giving thanks, he distributed them to those who were seated. So also with the fish, as much as they wanted. You've heard this story ever since you were a child in Sunday school. But it still should amaze you. The other Gospels tell us that Jesus asked his disciples to go ask the crowd if there was any food. And Andrew returns with this young boy's lunch. A good Jewish mother had packed her son lunch, five loaves and two fish. That's a pretty good lunch. That's a good lunch for me. But it's not a good lunch for 5,000 men. You add the children, the wives that would have been there, the, uh, the crowd was probably closer to 10,000. Five loaves, two fish. Not very much when the need was so great. As Jesus looked at the need, he had power over the need. He was able to overcome the things that were troubling the people. He had the power to change what was the reality. That reality was they only had five loaves and two fish. He was able to change it to his reality, which was he could make what from that as much food as he needed. For Jesus is the Son of God. He was there at the moment of creation. He was there as the world was spoken into existence. And as he stood there and he looked at those five loaves and two fish, we have a moment right here where creation takes place once again. As he begins to break the bread and break the fish and began to portion it out for the people. He multiplied that to fulfill the need. Jesus fulfilled the need for sustenance and he fulfilled the disciples' need for assurance. He made it so that the people had what they needed to be full. But what he was doing in the eyes of the disciples was he was building up their faith. He knew the day would come when he would die on the cross. He knew the day would come when he would be raised from the dead. He knew the day would come when he would be ascended into heaven. And he knew the day would come in which he would have to look at the disciples and say, Go therefore in all the world and to preach the gospel. And he knew that he had to build up their faith so that they would not be men who would cower behind that command, but that they would take the gospel and to share it with all people. Philippians chapter 4 verse 19 says, And my God will supply all your needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. Now to our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. The need you have in your life right now is the opportunity for God to build up your faith so that you can keep going. The needs you have are the way that he is going to sustain you through even more difficult times. Jesus took that opportunity and he built up his disciples' faith. He not only has the power to know our needs, he not only has the power to fulfill our needs, he has the power to fulfill us completely. Look at verse 12 and 13. Verse 12 and 13 tells us the whole story. When they were full, he told his disciples, collect the leftovers so that nothing is wasted. So they collected them and filled 12 baskets with the pieces from the five barley loaves that were left over by those who had eaten. I like verse 12. When they were full. Jesus didn't give them a snack. Jesus didn't give them a little bit to help them get along. Jesus filled up their bellies. You go into the third world today, it is much like what would be considered what the Jewish life had been like then. Food was scarce. There was very few times that people would have ever said they were full. 
You ate enough to be to sustain yourselves till the next meal. There would be some times when there would be a feast where people would be full. In our day and time, we're used to being full. We go to a restaurant and we eat till we're stuffed. We glutton ourselves and we're full. These people didn't know what it meant to be full on a day-to-day -day basis. But when Jesus fed them, they were full. He gave them everything that they needed and more. He tells the disciples to let the leftover so that nothing is wasted. Then they get 12 basketfuls. When God sees a need in your life and you trust Him to take care of it, he not only takes care of it, he gives you more than you could ever need. Isaiah chapter 58, 11 says, The Lord will always lead you, satisfy you in a parched land, and strengthen your bones. You will be like a watered garden and like a spring whose waters never run dry. God promises us that even in a parched land, he will take care of us. Today, we live in a time in which we are troubled. We're worried. We're sending buses out to feed our children because they're not in schools. But the day goes that if this continues, maybe the grocery stores will have to close. I'm not saying that to alarm you. I'm just saying, what if that happens? What if the day comes when we have to depend completely on God to take care of our needs like these people here? How is your faith? Where is your trust? Scripture tells us that God can take care of us even in a parched land. In this time in which we see all of the problems that we are facing, we serve a God who takes care of our needs. In his book, Facing Loneliness, J. Oswald Sanders writes this, The round of pleasure or the amassing of wealth are but vain attempts to escape from the persistent ache. The millionaire is usually a lonely man. The comedian is often more happy than his audience. Sanders goes on to emphasize that being successful often fails to produce satisfaction. Then he refers to Henry Martin, a distinguished scholar, as an example. Martin, a Cambridge University student, was honored at only 20 years of age for his achievement in mathematics. In fact, he was given the highest recognition possible in that field. And yet he felt an emptiness inside. He said that instead of finding fulfillment in his achievements, he had only grasped a shadow. After evaluating his life's goals, Martin sailed to India as a missionary at age 24. When he arrived, he prayed, Lord, let me burn out for you. And in the next seven years that preceded his death, he translated the New Testament into three different Eastern languages. Those notable achievements were certainly not passing shadows. When we talk about fulfillment, when we talk about how God can take care of our needs, we understand that it's just not Him taking care of that need that we think we have. It's Him giving us a desire that needs to be fulfilled. This young man was given a desire by God to do something greater than all the world could ever imagine. He was at the top of his field, but the only way that he could have fulfillment was that he traveled across the world, lived in a land that his family and his friends would have considered unusual worked hard translating scripture into three different languages. When we talk about fulfillment, that's fulfillment. Because of the, his work, 
millions have been able to read the scripture into their own language in the years since then. So this morning I ask you, what is your needs and how are you best fulfilled? Let me just give you some application. God knows what we need in this time of uncertainty. Some of us pray for a cure. We pray for a return of normalcy. But maybe he is giving us more time with our families. Maybe he is removing the distractions in our lives. Maybe he is desiring we seek him. I don't know about you. But the last two weeks, I've spent more time with my wife and my children than I normally do. And I know all of the jokes about what it is like to be a homeschool parent now. And I know all of the jokes about how marriages are suffering because we're spending so much time together. But maybe this is the way God wants us to be. Maybe he realizes that we had a need that none of us realize that we have. Maybe he realized that we needed to slow down. Maybe he realized that we needed to take more time to study his scriptures. Maybe he realized that we needed to turn off ESPN and quit going to sporting events and take some time and to focus on him. When we look, stop looking at satisfaction everywhere else, he is the one who can satisfy and fulfill us. He is the one who gives us hope. As we look at what's going on in our lives, as we look to realize that he is our hope, let us not be confused. God knows our needs. God knows how to fulfill those needs. And through all of this, God is fulfilling the needs that we have. While we are doing this time of having to social distance, we have been singing a song as our invitation hymn called, If My People Will Pray. Our prayer is that God will hear our land both spiritually and physically, for He is the one who provides our needs, for He is our help. Pray with me. Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning. Lord, I pray as people are sitting in their living rooms, maybe they're watching in their bedrooms, maybe they're watching from their cars, wherever they are, whether they're watching on the TV or on their computer or on their phone. Lord, I pray that you will use these words that we've said today to touch them. Lord, we pray that we will have faith in you, that we will believe that you know is exactly what's going on in our lives and that you are fulfilling us completely. Lord, I pray if there's anyone as they are watching this that's never accepted you as their Savior, that they will reach out to me or to someone else they know and ask how they can be a Christian. Or they'll simply just say this prayer. Father God, Please forgive me of my sin. It set me as your child. Thank you for sending your son to die on the cross for me, for raising him from the dead so that I can have forgiveness of my sins. I commit my life to you. Lord, we thank you. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen.
I want to thank all of you for watching this morning. We are very excited as we continue to do these uh, Facebook Live and YouTube broadcasts. Um, I want to encourage you to share this, but I, more importantly, I want you to spend some time praying, and I want you to reach out to people in your community, touch their lives, call them, check on them. If you know senior adults, check, make sure that they're okay. During this time, we're social distancing, but it doesn't mean that we have to stay apart. So please, make phone calls, check on each other, and love each other, and spend some time uh, worshiping Christ. I want to ask Rob to lead us in our benediction. Join with me in prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you once again that we've been able to worship you today. We're so glad, Lord, that the church is not a building, but the church is the people that are called out to serve you, those that know you as Lord and Savior. Father, not only our church family has been able to gather together, but many around the world that normally wouldn't be able to be touched by this service have been able to join in and worship the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. We pray as we go this week that you would be with us physically, help those that are sick, not just from COVID-19, but from other illnesses that uh, pervade our immortal bodies. Lord, be with us spiritually, emotionally. Help us in the strong way that Paul preached about today, that we may be about your kingdom work, telling people about a Savior that loves them and wants to give them eternal life. Thank you. Be with us this week. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.